everyone. Good morning. Start off here, just something that was on my heart from the Psalms. The Lord reigns, let the earth behold him. His, he goes before us. He, uh, clouds and thick darkness will surround him. Righteousness and justice will be the foundations of his throne before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens will proclaim his mystery. This is something that we, we talked about this morning a bit in Sunday school. We have the spirit and the power and the fire of the Lord. We need to use it. You know, the same, the same power that pulled Lazarus, the same power that caused the apostles to be able to go and speak, and, and not only just speak in different tongues in, in the people's uh, religion or in their name, their native language, but to speak boldly. And, and I think sometimes that's what we lack is the fearless to go and speak. You know, it, it's, it's like people are just like, oh, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah, oh, I do love the Lord. I love the Lord. Yeah, you know, I, I, but, but it doesn't go further than that. We need to take the next step in our, in our Christian walk. And they call it a walk because you're not supposed to stand still as much as you feel comfortable. The Lord reigns, let the earth be glad. We're going to look in the book of Ephesians here this morning. A wonderful, all, well, all the books are wonderful. This one has some really uh, profound statements that we just, we carry with us uh, all the time. Um, it is in chapter two. Uh, verse 8, Ephesians 2, 8, for it's by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. This is a gift from God, not from works, so that nobody can boast. Look what I did. Look at this. Yep, you know, you see that over there? I did that. And that, that's not what it's supposed to be. If we're going to, to be saved and we're going to go out and then do good works, we need to allow people to see our good works, as we talked last week, to see our good works and then give the credit to God. We have no credit. Uh, we should be thankful when we do something that, that God allows us to be part of his plan because by a word, the, you know, our God that created light and water and, and land, just by his word, he allows us to be a part of his plan. And, and when you think about that and you, you just pray on that, wow, he allows somebody like me to be a part of his plan that he could do himself in an instant and do it perfectly. Yet he allows me with my perfect imperfections and, and all the things that I have, my doubts, my fears, you know, uh, he allows me to be part of his plan. And, and as I think of that, I think of the young man that is over in Ukraine right now, pray pray for him that he is over there doing good work he's doing god's work ephesians a letter written by paul uh, ephesians was probably written around 60 a.d paul was in a roman prison at the time he was probably under house arrest because he really had done nothing like terroristic or anything. He was not a threat to the Roman Empire as much as some of the other where he needed to be thrown at this time into the Roman dungeon. Later, he was when he was writing 2 Timothy and, and it was his last book, uh, last letter that he wrote. He was admired in one of the worst places of the, the Roman prison. Here he probably was on house arrest and possibly he would be chained to a soldier so that you know, he wouldn't escape or anything, but he, he was free to write. 
And he, he, a lot of times he writes what's called these prison letters. Certainly uh, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, you know, they, they are, they're, they're very similar. And they were written all about the same time. So he, he had the ability for people to bring him things to write. Saved by grace through faith alone. Uh, this church in Ephesus uh, was in Asia Minor, that's Turkey right now, and Paul just felt it that he had to, to write back because he would go and he would be in Ephesus and stay there for two years, then he would leave, and as soon as he left, these people came in and they started ba bashing everything that Paul talked about. And they got some converts. They got some people that were on the fence when Paul was there, and they persuaded them to, to you know, not think about what Paul was talking about. So somebody would go over and, and be able to go in and see Paul and they'd say, hey, you know, there's some things going on. Here's what's going on back there that you maybe want to address. So Paul would write a letter. E Ephesians might have been, since it was not addressed to any one person, it was probably a letter that needed to be circulated around the churches in that area. Ephesians chapter six the armor of God. You hear a lot of this today. You know, the people are dressed up in combat gear and they got all the Teflon and Kevlar and, and everything, you know, in order to protect themselves. God says we can protect ourselves with armor, symbolic armor. This is his last chapter, the end of it in Ephesians. Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on, and you know, you would say, we used to say to people, if you could just take one of these gifts with you, what would you take? Oh, I'd take the helmet. Somebody else would say, I would take the sword. Well, we don't have that choice. Paul says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And, and boy, how many times, how many people, you see it, you can hear it, read about it. When they say, I'm going to go and I'm going to do this, and, or our church is going to go and we're going to do, and then something happens. Satan comes in and, and all of a sudden, it's, it's almost like on their Christian walk, they're walking backwards. We were, were never intended to be walking backwards on our Christian walk. And then you'll have, you know, I, I've been and seen churches where I've gone around and they'll say, oh yeah, you hear about all this Satan attacking and stuff. We've been in business here. We've been in church for about 80 years and there's never been any trouble in here. And, and I be there for a while and I'll think, well, you know, you ain't doing anything. You're not a threat. For these 80 years that you've been here, you've come in and sang a few songs and, and maybe had some communion and somebody come and they talk to you and, and then you, know, you drop some money in the collection plate and the last person out, turn off the light and lock the door. Satan's not going to bother you. He doesn't have to. You're not doing anything. You're not a threat to him. As, as the same as a person when they accept Jesus Christ. Up to that point, Satan was doing everything he can to keep them from that decision. So whenever they say, you know what, Satan, be gone. I am going to do this. I am going to be bathed in the Holy Spirit, and I am going to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior in my heart, and I don't care whatever, Satan, I'm doing this. Well, then Satan says, okay, now I'm going to start on you. This is so important that we follow up with someone that has accepted Jesus Christ because they may be thinking, okay, things are going to be good. I've accepted Jesus. I've made this great decision. Oh, but my gosh, I didn't think I would get all this grief and everything is down on me. You know, this is why we have to, to follow up with people that make these decisions because we want them to stand firm against the devil's schemes. Our struggle, and, and this is in different places in, in, the, in the New Testament, 
Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and again, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. If you look back in Ephesians, you're going to find that Paul used the term heavenly realm about six times, and it refers to this. We are part of the heavenly realm. We are on this side of heaven. And, and it's not, you know, if you say, okay, well, I'm going to go and fight against Satan, and I'm going to take a thousand AK-19s, AK-15s, whatever, you know. I'm going to take all these guns. I'm going to take a thousand of them. Satan will have 5,000. You say, I'm going to have all these spears. I'm going to have all these things here. Satan's going to bring twice as many. So you're not going to defeat Satan in a flesh-to-flesh kind of, of uh, war. Blood and, and flesh are not going to. It, it, we need to think about fighting a different kind of fight, not man on man. It may come to that. Our world certainly is heading in the, uh, terrible directions. But down the road, man to man on this side will probably occur. But the main purpose that we got to do, if we're going to get to the root of this, we have to realize that it is against Satan. It says uh, in here, uh, in, in Ephesians, that, that we're going to fight against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor. That's the second time now in, in just, uh, you know, two verses that he has used that term. Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm. This is what he's talking about, standing firm. We have been, the COVID showed that, you know, churches folded up and dried up whenever they said, oh, you, you're not allowed to, you're not allowed. They have, they don't have the ability to shut down a church. That was shown in John MacArthur out in, in California. If you want to meet, you can meet. You know, how often, you know, people just, churches just knuckled under. There was a pastor that says, I'm going to spend the last days of my ministry. I know I'm going to be in jail because I'm going to speak the truth and I'm going to stand firm. Well, and then the COVID come out and they said, hey, pastor, you're going to have to close down your, your church. Oh, okay, I guess we have to. I'm thinking if you knuckled under to that, you're not going to stand firm on the end days. You're not going to spend your last days in jail because you're just taking whatever is thrown at you from the government. We need to stand firm. We are a church. We represent God. And, and it's not this building. It is you. It's the people. You have to stand firm. You have to say, you know what? I know they're saying we shouldn't meet in church, but you know what? We're going to meet. Anybody that wants to come, if, if I was a pastor of, of a church, I would say to them, I'm going to be there. If you want to come, please come, but we're going to be open. I think sometimes people look for reasons not to go to church, and that's a shame because you should devote yourselves to prayer and you should devote yourselves to fellowship. The cross goes both ways, people. It is up and down. That's our relationship with God. It is the larger, the longer of the two places of the cross, but there is also the bar that goes horizontally. That is the relationship that we have with each other. And both of those are important. God, fellowship, this is where we can take a stand. If you don't want to take a stand for yourself, take a stand for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Put on the full armor of God. Stand firm, the belt of truth. Isaiah talks about that, 11.5. He says, righteousness will be his belt. Faithfulness, the sash that will be around his waist. Um, the, the spiritual weapon you have when you take this on is truth. The belt of truth. Remember, uh, you know, in the, the movie, in one, one of, I love the movie, A Few Good Men. You got Jack Nicholson here and you got Tom Cruise. And he's like, what do you want? I 
truth. He says, you can't handle the truth. Well, sometimes we can't handle the truth. The truth is you're allowed to go to church. The truth is that your neighbor needs your help. The truth is that the church needs something. You know, those are the truths that we live, and sometimes we don't follow those truths. We need to, to put on the belt of truth, of righteousness and faithfulness around our waist. We need to have truth, because what this is talking about right here, if you have the belt of truth on, it is not brute force that wins the battle, it is character. The belt of truth helps us to have character. Then it goes on. It says uh, you have the breastplate of righteousness in place. Isaiah 59, 17. It says, the old, and I'm doing this because I'm showing how the Old Testament prophecies and things are coming true in the New Testament. Isaiah 59, 17. He put on the righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. The Lord's armor here compares to believers' armor when we battle Satan, the breastplate of righteousness. The spiritual weapon that you have here is righteousness. And again, righteousness and character. So you're starting out by putting God's armor on to fight not the, the flesh, to fight the demons. You're having already, you're having character and you're having righteousness. That's a really good start. Then it says, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Uh, the gospel of peace is only here. In the New Testament, Paul writes about the gospel of peace right here. The, uh, Isaiah 52 is where this starts. Isaiah 52, and it is verse number, number seven. It says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation. Feet do this. And he is referring here, of course, that when there's a battle somewhere, uh, that they send a messenger back to tell the king and everybody that's waiting how the battle's going. And when you volunteered for this or you were a messenger, boy, you hoped that you were bringing good news because the term kill messenger comes from like this. You bring bad news back to the king, we're getting beat, we're getting overrun. Uh, sometimes the king was so mad immediately they would just kill the messenger. These people, these messengers, they would run in barefoot and they were susceptible to a lot of the things that were on the ground and they could get hurt. Here, fitted with readiness, your feet are fitted. Messengers, you are messengers. Your feet are protected and supported by footgear. The spiritual weapon that you have by putting on the feet of armor, having your feet fitted. It is the gospel of peace. So, so far we're talking about, we have truth, we have righteousness, and now you factor in peace. He says, in addition to this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. In uh, the book of Psalms, it is Psalms 35. Psalms 35, 2, it says, take up your shield, take up your armor, arise and come to my aid, calling for you to take up your armor. And, and this, is, this is Paul talking about things that people know about. 
it describes here a large Roman shield. They would, they would build these shields up, and they were fairly thin because they were big, and they wouldn't have to try. It, it was a chore to hold them up a long time, so they made them a little thin. The trouble with that is when these flaming arrows come, they would pierce that armor, and here you are, pierced armor, and there's a flaming arrow right there. So what they would do is they would take their shields and cover them with a, an animal leather or something, some kind of animal skin and before they went into battle they would wet that they would totally saturate the the skin that was on the front of their armor that way when a flaming arrow hit it would hit that water and it would extinguish the flame this is what Paul's talking about he says uh, it will extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one you, you if you're a Roman soldier the evil one could be you know some you know, some tribe or something. But when we are holding the, the, the shield of faith in our hands and we're, we're going to fend off the, the arrows of the evil one. The shields were mentioned in the Old Testament like uh, something like 23 times. Shields are for defense because we know Satan is going to attack. And the spiritual weapon you get here, it says, put, take up the shield of faith. So you see what's happening here. He's talking about taking up all the armor of God. So far you have truth, you have righteousness, you have peace, and now you add to that, you have faith. Then he goes on. He says, take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation we read in, in Isaiah. It says, as with the breastplate, God is symbolically described in Isaiah as putting on a helmet. The Romans felt you had to protect your feet and you had to protect your head. They were, they were just really adamant about that. Stones could be thrown, anything. And the Roman helmet was really a, a very good uh, defense thing. You had to protect your head. It was a necessity. Also, whenever you would stand around and you still had your helmet on, it was a symbol of victory. The spiritual weapon we have when we put on the helmet is the helmet of salvation. A wonderful thing. This is what we're looking for. You know, we, we, we're going to mill around and we're going to do the things that we do around here. We are going to have all the, 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 the truth and the righteousness, the gospel of peace. We are going to have faith. And now we add to that really the, 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 the goal of all of those things. We add to that now the helmet of salvation. That is what we need. Salvation is what we're looking for. It's what we do when we profess that we want to take Jesus Christ into our heart and live by his rules. We're going to be indwelled by the Holy Spirit. We are looking for salvation. And, and it's not like a prideful thing that we can say, you know what, I am saved, baby. Yeah, it's me and you, God. Yeah, me and you, right. It is a humbling thing. It is that you have been saved by God's grace. You have been saved by faith. And now you can say, I have salvation. And at that point, you're supposed to say, okay, God, I got it. What do you want me to do? What's my goal? I, uh, you know, I'm saved. What, you know, they tell us, we, I've been through Billy Graham and, and different, you know, 10 Mile Baptist Association and Abco Pad, the Baptist people down there. I have gone through so many of these things where they say, you know, you need to go out and you need to recruit and our job is to go spread the word. But all of them, the first thing they say is before you go out, you better, and you're going to talk to somebody, you better know how you stand with God. You better have in your heart, I am saved. I, am, I have salvation from my Lord Jesus Christ up there. And with that, I am going to go out and do his work. Salvation, the helmet of salvation. And then the last thing he talks about here, he says, put on the helmet of salvation and the sword of spirit which is the word of God. It says in Isaiah 49, and it's verse 2, he gave me a mouth like a sharpened sword, which is the word of God. Now we're going on offense. All the things that I've mentioned before, the shield, the helmet, 
the, the, the feet are covered, the belt, the breastplate, all of those things are for defense. Now, though, now we got some offense. Now we can stand and we, knew, we know that we have been defended against Satan. Now we can take this sword. And it's just not a regular sword. This is a symbolic sword, and it is the Word of God. The Word of God is like a double-edged sword that cuts. And with that, the spiritual wisdom, the weapon that you get from the sword is the Word of God. And the best way, we talked about it, the best way here that you're going to exercise the Word of God is to have prayer. You want to go talk to somebody about God? Talk to God about them first. Ask that He will open their heart for your message. Then proceed to go and wait for the time that you see where there may be an opportunity to talk to that person. It may take a while. You know, okay, well, it's 8 o'clock a.m., and I'm praying for this guy. Well, you know what? It's 5 o'clock already, and he hasn't done anything. There may be a lot of 8 to 5s that you go through before this person is ready to hear your voice. The Spirit, the sword of God. And then finally it says, and prayer in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayer and requests. Keep this in mind. Be alert. Always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. See what word stands out? This is a very, very good way of writing back in, you know, the, the Old Testament, certainly, and then in the New Testament, you repeat things. You say, I want to proclaim, and I want to speak these words fearlessly. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. So what in, in, from 18, 19, and 20 in Ephesians, what's, what's Paul asking for? He says, number one, pray in the Spirit. Pray on all occasions. Pray prayers of all kinds. Pray with requests. Pray always and be alert. Pray for God's people. Pray for Paul, the apostle. Pray that Paul's words will be preached fearlessly because he has been in chains most of his life after he went and, and followed Jesus. A lot of his life was, was not good. It was really a, a bad life for Paul, but he accepted it uh, joyfully because he knew that he was God's ambassador. And finally, he says, and this, this is right here is where he's speaking to us. Pray that I declare God's word fearlessly as I should. You're going to hear people in, in your church. You're going to hear people at work. You're going to hear somebody at the bingo hall talking, and, and you know what they're saying about the Bible is something they just picked out, and it's, it's, it's wrong. And the people around there are like, oh, yeah, that, yeah. You have to say, excuse me, wait a minute. What you said there is really not true. The way that scripture verse reads or the way that that passage reads is not what you said. And, I, you know, you don't need to reach over the table and grab them and, and, and throw their bingo chips like all over the floor or whatever. But you need to be fearless, not confrontational, but you need to fearlessly uphold God's teachings. That's what we're called to do to speak when we don't want. How many of us have talked to somebody and then gone home that night and went, oh, wow, yeah. I just talked to somebody at the revival. I just talked to somebody at the, at the church that was visiting. And, and yeah, I, I mean, I, I, know, I know what I said, but I didn't know that I knew that. Well, those words came from God. He says, give me the words that I will use and give me those words and I will speak them fearlessly. Paul was asking for words to speak. Can we do any different? Asking for the words that we need so that we can speak God's word. And finally, we need armor, all the armor. 
We need the full armor of God to protect us, and we need a sword, which is God's word, because that is what is going to allow us to attack. And right here, people, this is God's word. There might as well be a sword, but if it were a sword, that means that you think you're out there fighting flesh and blood. This is God's sword, and it is meant to go against Satan. So please, if you would, take away from today what we've talked about. You are saved by grace. You're saved by faith, not anything that you have done. And number two, in order to go out, you need to know how you stand with God. And then when you go out, take God's word and speak it fearlessly. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us this time to be together as a church family. Amen.